بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين حبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Jazakum al khair for quieting down. Normally, the salams used by speakers are to quiet down, and that everybody's already ready to go. So, the topic today is about repentance, or my topic for today is about repentance, and specifically from the from the perspective of Shu'ayb, uh, Prophet Sadiq alayhi salam, Prophet Sadiq alayhi salam. And so, so what I'm going to do is the 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 issue of repentance is not unique to Prophet Sadiq and his people. A repentance was something that every prophet told their nation to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because we're, we're, I was asked to give from the perspective of Salih alayhi salam, I will do so. And I would like to begin by quoting a verse from Surah Hud, Surah number 11, verse 61, in which Salih alayhi salam talks to his people and tells them the basic call that every prophet told their, their people. And I'm sure you've been hearing the, this echoing throughout the conference as you learn about each specific prophet. And he told them, Allah says, وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صَالِحًا قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُهُ هُوَ أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ وَاسْتَعْمَرَكُمْ فِيهَا فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ إِنَّ رَبِّي قَرِيبٌ مُجِيبٌ he said to the people of Salih that, number one, the people of Salih are who? Thamud. وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صَالِحًا So Thamud were the people of Salih. And he told them, worship Allah. Worship Allah who you have no deity other besides Him. And he says, Allah is the one who brought you out from the land, and He's the one who settled you therein. So therefore, make istighfar to Allah. فَاسْتَغْفِرُونَ Right away, he says, make istighfar to Allah and turn to Him in repentance. Indeed, Allah is near and He is responsive to the one who calls. Allah is near to you and responds to you when you call to Him. And the same is the same message again that all the prophets gave to their people. Now, what's interesting is that before I get into the issue of repentance, I want to talk first about the, the idea of sinning. Right? Because everybody sins, right? Everybody sins. And so... Amr al-Khattab, he was asked, and Imam Ahmed recorded this in his book of Zuhud, he was asked, who is better? A man who never feels a desire to sin, and therefore he doesn't sin. Or someone who does feel a desire to sin, but then he doesn't sin. Who do you think is better? Who, do you think, who, do, who thinks the first is better? That he never feels a desire to sin at all. One, two, a few. How many people the second is better? He feels a desire to sin, and he doesn't sin. MashaAllah, you are right. Why? And if the people who raise their hand first, you're also right. But we're not going to talk about you guys. Why are you right? Abu Khattab, he answered with, with a verse in the Quran. He said, the one who feels a desire to sin but then doesn't sin. And he said, why? They are those who Allah tested their hearts for piety. Right? The one who thinks about sinning, but then he doesn't do it. Allah's testing him. Right, the girl walks by on campus, and you're like, ah, and you turn away. Allah tested your heart. And you lowered your gaze, you passed the test. And so for that person, it's more, more difficult, right? He's struggling every day, he's working on it, versus the person who's chilling back and relaxing, right? She was some people outside of the school, he's got no issues with girls or nothing, he's just, he's, he's got it going on. He doesn't think about sinning, his heart's not being tested for it. And so for him, Amr Khattab is saying, the one who feels a desire, his heart's being tested and he's passing the test every time he lowers his gaze, every time he doesn't do what Shaitan tells him to do. Now that's important. Why? Because the problem is not thinking about sinning. Right? If you think about sinning, that's not necessarily in and of itself a problem. The problem is if you commit the sin. Right? So in Sahih Bukhari, it says that the Prophet said, whoever intends to do a bad deed, whoever intends to do a bad deed, but then he doesn't do it, what happens to him? How many good deeds or bad deeds does get recorded for this man or this woman? He gets a he gets a good deed. For not doing a bad deed, he gets a good deed. Right now, if you do the good deed, how many good deeds do you get? 
You get 10 times. مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا If you do one good deed, you get 10 times the reward. If you think about doing a good deed and you don't do it, you get one reward. If you think about doing a bad deed and you don't do it, you get one reward. If you think about doing a bad deed and you do it, how many, how many bad deeds do you get? One. one. 10 to one, one to one. So the, the scale is set up for you to succeed. Right? You're doing business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't lose. You can't lose because Allah is so, Allah's the most merciful. Allah's gonna hook you up. Every time you do one good deed, you get ten. Right? Imagine, imagine going to imagine going to imagine going like, I don't know what you guys do. You guys buy Pokemon cards anymore? <laughs> Hopefully you pass that Right? Basketball cards maybe. Back in my day we used to collect basketball cards. Like I used to love Grand Hill. I had like some 60 something cards of Grand Hill. Right? How did I give up that hobby? Right? Imagine if I go to the card store and I'm like, alright, you know, I want I want one Grand Hill card and he gives me ten for free. Here, just take ten more. He'll go out of business, right? And I'll be banking. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's al ghani, he is the rich. For him, giving ajr is, is, is not difficult. And for us, getting ajr from Allah is not difficult. By not doing a bad deed, you get good deeds. By doing good deeds, you get more good deeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for us. And, and uh, he's made it, he's made it easy for us to get the good deeds and get to Jannah. Now, I'm gonna go on a little tangent. Some of you who have listened to me before in, in classes with me, then you know what I'm about to say. All right, we have this debate, right, of, of this idea of to sin or not to sin. To sin or not to sin. Now I'm going to go on a tangent from Surah Hajarat, and that's why I don't, some of my students here are like, yeah, we know what's going on. What I'm about to talk about is this. Allah says in verse 2 of Surah Hajarat, Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawta sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. You might be thinking, hey man, we, it's 2009, bro. We lived 1,400 years ago. How do I raise my voice above the voice of the Prophet? And you respond by saying, by doing something contrary to the Sunnah. So the Prophet's Sunnah lives amongst us today, right? Yes or no? Yes. And so if you, now you, let's say, let's say I'm, I'm about to drink some water, right? And I have it in my left hand, and, 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 and then the brother comes to me and tells me, hey, the Prophet said, said, eat with your right hand. And I have two options now. I can say, bump, bump you, and drink with my left hand. And what am I doing? I'm actually really at what I'm saying. When I would Billah, Ya Rasulullah, I don't need you. Right? Because that's the Prophet's teachings. Versus if I switch it to my right hand, I drink with my right hand, what am I doing now? I am lowering my voice to the voice of the Prophet. I submit to what the Prophet said. Now, why is that important when it comes to sinning? Because the next verse, which Amr Khattab said earlier, he's, the next verse is, Those who lower their voices to the Prophet وسلم, for them, Allah has tested their hearts for piety. For them, it's forgiveness and a great reward. Right, so by lowering your voice to the voice of the Prophet, by switching that water bottle to your right hand when homeboy tells me to switch it, I have lowered my voice to the voice of the Prophet. What happens? Allah says, He tested your heart for piety and you passed the test. And for them is a forgiveness and a great reward. Just by listening to the Prophet, I said, Right, the scholars say that this verse applies to anybody who at any time thinks about doing a bad deed. But then he doesn't do it, remembering what the Prophet ﷺ told him. And so therefore, this person lowered his voice to the voice of the Prophet by not doing something the Prophet said not to do. And therefore, this person becomes eligible for what? Forgiveness and a great reward. This person becomes eligible for forgiveness and a great reward. Now, what's interesting about this verse is this. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ those who lower their voice to the voice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah says that they are those who Allah imtahana qulubahum. Allah tested their hearts. Now, if I say, if I tell you guys that you guys, in Arabic, right, how do you say that you have a test today? Indi imtihan al right? I have a test today. Imtihan in Arabic means test. Now, what does imtihan mean in classical Arabic? Right, because Quran is fusha Arabic, right? It's not like... You know, I'm a sheikh, I want to eat it, so I study it. Classical Arabic, imtahana. What does imtahana mean? 
The word imtahana was used in reference to gold. Right? How do you get pure gold? Anybody know? Huh? You mine it? Okay, you mine it, but you got gold mixed, mixed with rock, mixed with iron, whatever. How do you get pure 100% gold? You gotta put it in the fire. You gotta burn it. Right? Put it in a furnace and melt the gold. When you melt gold, then all the impurities are removed and you're left with what? Pure 100% gold. Now, the Arabs used to say, that you purify gold with fire. The same word that Allah says here, They are those who Allah tested their hearts, but it says what? Purified their hearts. Why is that important? Because what's the topic for the speech? The importance of repentance, a means of purification. Right, so when you lower your voice to the voice of the Prophet, before you even repent, in the struggle that you go through every day, when you know you're, 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 you're struggling for an exam, you know, instead of studying, you're watching the pisses, you know, smoke the Celtics, whatever, and, and now you're sitting in the exam the next day and you're like, just check it out, the guy, and then they're like, oh man, the Prophet said, whoever cheats is not amongst us. Cheating doesn't fly in Islam. So he's like, okay, I'm lower my gaze, I'm not cheating. You lower your voice to the voice of the Prophet and what happens is, Allah is purifying your heart. He's not just testing your heart, but He's purifying your heart. So the verse really means, those who lower their voice to the voice of the Prophet, Allah is making your hearts pure. Free from any other you know, worldly desires, all those things are gone, and you come out with a pure heart. Now, has anybody seen you know, the making of swords and stuff like that? And you guys seen that Lord of the Rings, you know what I'm talking about? Right? Isn't that like an intense scene? Like you gotta put the sword in the fire, you gotta bang it, and you know, sparks are flying. And it's intense, right? Like if you wanna get pure gold, you're putting it inside a fire. Isn't that like, like you're talking about heat, intensity, you, this, this very strong imagery comes. Now why is that interesting? Because is it easy to lower your gaze when a girl walks by? No? <laughs> Unless of you, I mean, it's, it's not easy, right? So that process that you're going through is hard, just like just like the process gold goes through to become pure, it's a difficult process. And so you're struggling every day, right? You're going, going walk into high school and, and yeah, I mean, the concept of modesty has completely been eradicated from our society, right? There's no such thing anymore in this culture. And so you're like, how do I maintain being a Muslim man? How do I lower my gaze? How do I not cheat? How do I respect my mom? How do I etc. 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 As you're going through those steps, is it difficult? Yeah, it is. It's a difficult growing process. But as you go through those difficulties, your heart gets stronger and stronger. You know the Prophet said, every time you sin, you get a black, a black spot on your heart, right? And every time you do a good deed, you get a, a white spot on your heart. Right? So every time you, you, know, you don't sin, you lower your voice to the voice of the Prophet, you don't sin and you do a good deed, your heart's getting whiter and whiter until you become like, you guys watch, you know, Dragon Ball Z, Super Saiyan? Yeah. You know, that, that process of becoming Super Saiyan is hard, right? And that's the process of becoming a muttaqi. That's the process of becoming someone who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until finally that difficult process of, you know, three episodes, he's standing there like this. You know, three episodes straight. And then the fire's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's it. Then what happens? After that difficult process of, you know, like, the, you know, strength and trying and difficulty, all those things, you become super sane. You become super muttaqi. Right? Your heart, like, so that's why Amr al-Khattab, that's why Amr al-Khattab, when he would walk down the street, which way would Shaitan go? Oh, I was out. He couldn't, stand, he couldn't stand with Amr because Amr was a super muttaqi. And so that's why when you're struggling with sin, number one, realize it's normal. It's not easy to lower your gaze. It's not easy to respect your parents. It's not easy to etc, etc, etc. It's difficult. But as you're doing so, your iman level is going up and up and up. Your heart is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. Every step of the way. Right? Allah says, now this is interesting, He says, he says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ And struggle in the way of Allah, as is Allah's right to be, for it to be struggled in His way. Now is that easy or hard? To struggle in the way of Allah as is His right? Is that easy or hard? That's hard. To give you an example, the angels, the Prophet said that there's no space on the, in, the, in, the, in the heavens. That there, except that there's angels, since the day they were created, prostrating, ma making sizzah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
from the day they were created until the day of judgment. On the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, they will raise their heads up and they will say, Subhanak ya Allah, ma'abadnaka haqqa ibadati. How perfect you are, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have not worshipped you, as is your right. And they spent their whole lives, centuries, making sujda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So struggling in the way of Allah is not easy. So it's hard, but then look what Allah says next. He says, huwa jatabakum. He chose you. Ijtaba' means that, ijtaba' means that, that let's say I, 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 I'm looking at these five brothers in front of me right here, right? So I want to pick somebody who's going to be like, I want to ask him a question and bring him up here and I'll give him candy in front of everybody. So looking at the five guys, who's like paying attention the most? Right, this my man right here, he's sitting up, he's listening. But if I just got lazy from the food and they're a little tired, man, that's cool, it's understandable. So I'm going to pick him, what's your name? Rahim, I'm going to pick Rahim. I'm going to say, Rahim, this, this, I think he's the best student. Based on some criteria I have, he looks to be a little studious, you know. This brother right here is taking notes, maybe I'll pick him. Ijtaba'ah. When Allah says, tabakum, that's the same thing. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen you above everybody else for a reason. For a reason. What, is, what does that mean? So when Allah says that, struggle in the way of Allah as is right. That's hard, right? We said that. Then Allah is telling you, but I picked you above the other 4.5 billion people on the face of the planet who aren't Muslim. I picked you to be Muslim. I chose you because I see something special in you that I don't see in anybody else. And therefore, I made you Muslim. Allah chose you. Allah chose you to come here in this conference. And so now, how do you feel? Like, all right, maybe, maybe, maybe I can do this, right? I mean, if Allah chose me, maybe I can do this. Then Allah says that He has not made anything difficult upon you in your religion. Again, He's reminding you it's easy. But then He says, Millat Ibrahim, you have to follow the way of Ibrahim. Now, is following the way of Ibrahim easy or difficult? <laughs> difficult. Right? Ibrahim, he, had, he was commanded to slaughter his son, right? He had to put his son down and literally he took a knife to his throat and he actually did the, the slitting movement. He didn't just like put him there and the ram came. He actually slit his throat, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it not to cut. Ibrahim had, was thrown in, the, in a fire, right? And then Allah told the fire, Ya na rukuni barada wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Ibrahim says that the time he was in the fire was the best time of his life. Like he was straight chilling, like AC, you know, like, like everything was nice. Like the ropes got burned off and he came out. You know, he was, he had the best time of his life was the time of the fire. So if Allah can make, make fire, cool, if he, then he can make knives, not cut. Ibrahim was commanded to leave his wife and his baby son in the middle of a desert where there's no water, where there's no, you know, populace, there's no city, no town, no nothing. Is that hard? Yeah, that's hard. It's a test. But why did Allah say, minute Ibrahim here? Because two reasons. One, is Allah telling you to slaughter your son? No. Is Allah not telling you to leave your wife or your husband and your kids in the middle of a desert? Is Allah not throwing you in a fire? No. So, number one, you don't have it as bad as Ibrahim had it. Number two, just like Allah said to help Ibrahim through his tests, if you keep trying, if you keep trying to struggle in the way of Allah, Allah will help you through your tests. Allah will help you through your tests. Now, having said that, how many of you guys took physics? Alright, so most of you guys, I'm going to give you a little physics question. Now, what's the difference between static friction and kinetic friction? You guys remember this? All right, let's say let's say I have this I have this podium, right? And I'm trying to push it. What am I trying to overcome first? Static friction, right? Static friction is a, is, a, is the amount of friction that is present when an object is still. It's static. Then once I start moving it, then what am I trying to overcome? Kinetic friction. Now, which of the two is harder? Right? Let's say your your, your mom tells you to like move move the couch. When you straight, when you try to push it first, is it easier or harder? It's harder, right? Then once, it's like, once it gets going, then it's, it's easier. So that's the same way with trying to stop sinning. Let's say you've got something that you always do. You always back, you always, you know, watch a show you shouldn't be watching. You always do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You always disrespect your parents. Whatever it is, in the beginning, you're going to overcome static friction. So the beginning is going to be harder, right? But as your heart gets closer to closer to the super muttaqi level, then you become kinetic friction, right? It becomes easier and easier and easier. And so that's how you work with. Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ هُدَى Those who اهْتَدَوْ, those who seek guidance, Allah will increase them in guidance. وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ And He will give them taqwa. اهْتَدَوْ, for those of you who like Arabic, comes from اِفْتَعَلَ Which means, it doesn't mean you just seek guidance, it means like every day you're working on it. You're in the trenches, every day you're trying, you're making du'a to Allah, you're struggling, you might fall, but you get back up again, you might fall again, you might get back up again, but you keep trying to get closer to Allah. For that person, Allah says, he will give him guidance. Right? You take one step to Allah, 
Allah takes 10 steps back to you. You go walking to Allah, Allah comes running back to you. So it's about trying. Right? So when you guys, the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because the Prophet said, every son of Adam is a sinner. Every one of them is a sinner. But the best of sinners are those who repent the most. So the first part, everyone is a sinner. Everybody sins. So if you commit a sin, don't let Shaitan come to you and trick you. See, Shaitan, he plays tricks on us, man. Let's say you, you, you stay up late one, one night, your parents aren't home, you turn on the TV, right? See, this is the thing, man. Mashallah, I think Muslims, especially the youth, one thing we do a lot is we make dhikr. You guys agree? Like, especially with tasbihs, right? We come home, you know, we're like school, 4 p.m., you know, we want to watch Pokemon or Dragon Ball Z, whatever, we come home. We right away, we grab our masbaha and we start flipping through it. What is our masbaha? The remote control, right? Channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, channel 4, channel... And we just spend hours and hours on, the, on, our, on, our, on our 2009 version of a masbah. Right? So in this case, what I'm telling you is that, okay, let's say you go home, your parents aren't there, and you're watching a TV show you shouldn't be watching. What happens, right? First you're like, make sure nobody's looking, make sure your mom's upstairs, make sure you know your dad's you know, in the garage, and then lower the volume a little bit, right? And you commit that sin. Right, you watch whatever that, that scene and then and now you're like, man, it's time for Maghrib. You know, and then Shaitan comes to you and like, man, you a sinner, man. What you mean pray Maghrib? Man, you look what you just did, man, you can't pray Maghrib. And you're like, oh well, I already prayed, you know, I'm gonna go to sleep take a nap. Shaitan tricks you into thinking that, oh, because you sinned, you're not good enough to worship Allah anymore. No. You sinned, the Prophet said everybody sins. So it's okay, it's 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 not okay to sin, it's normal to sin, because that's something human, but what you're supposed to do if you do sin, is come right back to Allah. So go right back and pray. Don't let shaitan do the opposite and take you farther away. No, you come right back to pray. So, so when, 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 when you're struggling with sin, here's some tips. Number one, when shaitan comes to you and tells you to do something wrong, right, number one, what should you say? A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Right, first thing you say is shaitan rajim and you seek help from your brothers and sisters. Let's say you can't get up for fajr. Call 10 different people from your friends and get, tell them all to give you a wake-up call at 6.30 a.m. Wake up for Fajr. Get help. And lastly, lastly, see, recognize who it is you're sinning against. You know, uh, Hassan al-Basr, he said that, don't look at the, small, the smallness of the bad deed you do. لا تنظر إلى صغر المعصية ولكن انظر إلى عظمة من عصيت Rather, look at the greatness of the one who you've sinned against. Hussein ibn Ali, radiallahu anhu, a man came to him and he said, he said, I can't stop sinning. Right? I always sin. I just constantly, I just can't stop. So Hussein ibn Ali tells him, like, this is the best petrol for you guys, right? Pay attention. If you guys want to do bad deeds, I mean, hopefully you don't. But if you want to, how many of you guys want to do bad deeds? Don't worry. <laughs> just checking if you guys are if you want to do bad deeds, I'm going to give you the petrol to do bad deeds. Right here, on the spot, and it's from, from Hussein ibn Ali. All right, number one, if you want to do bad deeds, you have to meet these five criteria, then you can go ahead and do it. He said, number one, he says, that go ahead and do bad deeds, but don't use the energy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you through the food he has provided for you to do the bad deeds. And the man's like, shoot me. <laughs> Every time I eat from Allah? All right, give me, give, give me number two, give me number two. So he says, all right, you're, you're living on the land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at least if you're going to sin against Allah, don't do on his land. Right, go somewhere else. So he's like, mm. all right, I can't do that. Number three. Number three, okay, fine. You can't do number one, two, number three. Door number three is, all right, at least if you're going to sin, do it where Allah SWT is not going to see you. Right, go, go hide. <laughs> Does Allah still see you? Yeah. So he's like, all right, that doesn't work. <laughs> number four, he says, when the angel of death comes to you, tell him I'm not ready yet. Like me, like Musa Ali Salaam, right? <laughs> like Musa Ali Sayyid gave the angel of death a punch in the face and he went back to Allah Subh'ala and said, your servant's not ready to die. No Can you do that? I mean, the angel of death's going to jack you. Unless you are a good believer. And number five, he says, I can't do that. So number five, he, Hussein Ali tells him, when you're thrown into hell, try and get out of it. And the man's like, enough, enough. By Allah, Allah will never see me, see, see, see me commit a sin after today. Right, so realize who it is you're sinning against. Allah Subh'ala has given you everything. Right, there's, there's, a, there's a guy in New York, about a month ago, this hit the papers, a month and a half or so. This guy in New York, his wife had kidney failure. 
right? And so kidneys are like, like the really, really important organs in your body, right? It's like heart, liver, and like kidneys. Like without kidneys, you're gonna die, right? So his wife has kidney failure, and so she needs a kidney transplant or she's gonna die. And so lo and behold, her husband has the kidney type that would be that could be given to her and she could survive. So he says he's a being good husband. And he's like, okay, I'll do the surgery, I'll give you one of my kidneys. So he does the surgery, he gives her his kidney. A year later, his wife cheats on him. She goes and has an affair with somebody. And so the husband finds out. And he is livid. He's like, I gave you a piece of me, man. I gave you my kidney. Like that's, that's, I mean, you took a piece of my organ in your body and because of that, you're now living. And you go and cheat on me? He was so upset, he filed a lawsuit. He said, I want my kidney back. <laughs> so the court's like, what do I do? I mean, if we take his kidney back, you know, then, then what, you mean? He's, he's gonna die. So he's like, all right, fine, just give me a million dollars and a half and I'll be good. <laughs> so imagine how that guy felt, right? He gave him his own, he gave her his own kidney and she goes and does this. Now think about this. How then should you feel when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you your kidneys, has given you your eyesight, has given you your skin, has given you your health, has given you your brain, has given you your spinal cord, has given you your bones, has given you your limbs, has given you your family, has given you your, your wealth, has given you your car, has given you your cell phone, has given you your glasses, has given you... Until the end. And you use those same blessings Allah has given you to sin and transgress against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How should you feel? Now think about that. Right, Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you try and count the... What does that verse mean? The bounties, the blessings of Allah, you can't count it. But what does the verse say? Does it say, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا It says ni'ma. What is the difference? Arabic people. Ni'ma and ni'ma. Exactly. Ni'ma is plural, ni'ma is single. What does the verse say? When do ni'mat Allah. Even if you try to count one blessing of Allah, you can't do it. Right? The blessing of having eyesight, for example. Think of how many things could go wrong in your life had you not had eyesight. You can't even count one blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll end, I was going to break this speech into two actually. I'll end the first part with a friend of, example of a friend of mine, Zuhair Munshi rahimahullah. He was a friend of mine, he died when he was about 20 years old. He was born with muscular dystrophy. Right, so he's a young man. Now muscular dystrophy is a disease where one of the genes that codes the, the connection between muscles and tissue is not there anymore. So basically, as your body and bones develop, your muscles don't develop. So when we were young, you know, Amir was with me, the, the guys, we would play with Zuhair, we would run around with him. He was able to, you know, hang sort of. As we got older, his body grew, but his muscles didn't grow. So he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't keep up with us. Towards the later part of, part of his life, he was uh, wheelchair ridden. So he would only come out of his house on Friday to Jummah, and he would see the guys. And then he would go back. And it got worse. It got worse to the point that he could only sit in two positions, lying down or sitting up, uh, and his brother would have to help him sit up. He couldn't eat. He had a, a, a tube into his stomach to feed him. He couldn't use the bathroom by himself. He couldn't change by himself. He couldn't do anything. He had a neck brace to support his neck, and he couldn't even literally, he could barely move by himself. So somebody who's been tested by Allah, so a lot of the blessings we have, like strength and ability to move and you know get a job and go to school, all those are blessings. He didn't have those. Yet look at his spirit. He would, every day that he was able to, he would go online and make da'wah online on, on forums online. He took classes from the Aris Institute based out of Texas, the Islamic classes, and people said about him he was the most dedicated student. Studying Islam even though he has every excuse to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, one of the, the nurses that would come home and take care of him, the hospice, one of them took shahada on his hands. Da'wah all the time, all the time. He even made a book, and I encourage you to buy it. Go online and search The, the Blunderous Adventures of Nasih Man. He wrote a comic book, and it's published. More than what we did, and he doesn't even have the help. You know when he died? The brothers who watched him, Amir watched him, another brother, they said about him that, 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 you know when he played mafia? You guys played mafia before? Yeah. You know when you wake up, you know after you kill somebody, you wake up at night and the guy's dead and he sees you and you just give him that smile. You're like, yeah, I know something that you didn't know, right? He said that Zuhair had that kind of smile when he was washing his body on his face. And, and you know what Zuhair's wish was? Imagine you're this person. You know what his wish was? They would always tell people to make dua for him for? 
Allah give me back my strength. Allah let me get married. Allah let me have education. Allah let me go to school. What do you think of us? Let me have kids. His one dua always, and he told everybody this. Right when I went to Hajj, he told me, Farhan, make this dua for me. He says, what? Well, just when I die, just ask Allah to accept me as a shaykh. That's it. That's all I want. And we ask Allah to accept him as a shaykh. Allah not me. But how does that make us feel? Right? I mean, we're, we're, Allah has given us so much more than that. So shouldn't we try and do more than what he did? Shouldn't we try more, more than what he did? Right? So it comes back to struggle and trying. Come back to struggle and trying. I, I began by saying that you are going to sin. That is right. But you have to make repentance from that sin. Don't let that sin stop you from... It's like a handbrake, right? You have a handbrake up and you're trying to drive a stick shift. You're going so slow. As soon as you drop the handbrake, poof, you take off. Right? So drop that handbrake and start working on yourself to getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright? Now, how many guys have seen the show FX 30 Days? You guys know what I'm talking about? There was a guy, this white guy from like Hickville, North Carolina. They brought him and they made him live with the Muslims in Canton. Right? And they said for 30 days... Alright, I need you guys to work with me. Alright? So if you guys keep it down, inshallah, then we can get through this quick. I have 20 minutes and I, and, and, and I have about 50 minutes of material to get <laughs> No, it's, okay, let's go. We'll try to do it, inshallah. So FX 30 days, right? So this, this white guy, he's living with Muslims in Canton for 30 days, right? He has to live as a Muslim, grow his beard, wear a dopey, you know, wear the kurta, the whole nine yards, right? So what they do is they take him, they take him to, I forget if it was Howell or Pinckney, Michigan. Either of those cities, though, was like, is like, as Howell, Michigan, right? That's like, like, non-Muslim friendly central. I don't want to say anything worse than that because it's being recorded. Okay, <laughs> so he goes there, and right, they have him do, you know, do, do street dawah, right? So they give him pamphlets, and he's on, he's on the street, and he's like, hey man, would you like to know about Islam? And she's like, Islam? Right? And they just give him the dirtiest, like, mean mug, just like you guys do, right? Brothers who don't know each other here, just walk by and does like, and we're Muslims, man, why do you guys got to mean mug each other? You know, to be nice. But these people were mean mugging him, they're like, man, this guy, he's wearing a kurta and a dopey and the beard and stuff. So everybody's all looking bad at him, right? So the, the, the host of the show, I forget his name, he's like, he starts asking people in the street, he's like, all right, I'm going to tell you something. And what I tell you, tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Right? So he says, like, Jesus. And they're like, love. <laughs> like, Christianity. They're like, charity. And then they're like, Islam. <laughs> and they're like, eh, eh, eh. like, terrorism, bombs, man, men with beards, and blah, 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 blah. Right? And so that's the perception people have. Right? Now, Prophet Sallallahu he said that every religion has a defining characteristic. Right? So when I think of Christianity, I think of love and charity. I'll be honest, I don't know if that's a defining case, but that's what I think of. Right? Because that's the part of the propaganda and marketing and everything. And some Christians are like that too, but... So what is the defining characteristic of Islam? The Prophet said, the defining, said the defining characteristic of Islam is Haya. Modesty. Modesty, shyness. Now the definition of Haya is basically, it's modesty, shyness, but it's also anything, right, that stops you from doing something wrong. Or anything that pushes you to do something good. You know like those cartoon shows you have like the angel and the devil? Yeah. Right? That angel is like is like just put like hayat like on the shirt. That's 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 hayat for you. Right? Anytime you think you're doing something wrong and your modesty tells you not to, that's your hayat. Why am I mentioning that? Because in the Quran and the Sunnah, there's four types of hayat emphasized. Number one is hayat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having modesty and shyness with Allah. What does that mean? The Prophet ﷺ told his companions, have modesty of Allah as this is due right. And they said, they, they said, we do that. We have that. And the Prophet said, no, that's not what I mean. He said to have modesty of Allah as this is due right, let one guard what his head contains. Let one guard what his head contains. So what you see, what you hear. So instead of rolling up to the masjid, bumping 50 cents, roll up to Salah with you, right? Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen. I think we do that actually when I roll up to the masjid. When you guys roll to school, that's a different story, right? Right? Guard what your head contains from what you see, from what you do, from what you listen to, even in your thoughts. Be careful how you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sharia. Number two, have hayat with angels. Oh, sorry, the, the, the second description is guard your stomach from what it contains. So most of us don't have this issue of eating haram, right? But anything you don't eat haram is part of having modesty of Allah. Number three, remember death and destruction. So let's say you have this. You know, you, you set up, you know, you have this plan in your mind that tonight when you go home, you know, you're going to sneak out and you're going to go to a party at school, whatever. Think about that. When you, on your way to that party, you're going to die. Would you still do it? Probably not. As the Prophet said, remember a lot, the destroyer, destroyer of pleasures, which is death. 
Remember death and destruction? The Prophet said lastly, that the one who is modest of Allah, he doesn't have attachment to this world. Or he's not attached to this world. So modesty with Allah. Number two, why is this important? Because the defining characteristic of Islam is hayat. So this is something very, very important in our religion, in our teachings. And we don't hear about it enough. Number two is hayat with angels. For example, right, the example we gave when you go home and you want to watch that show and you're checking your back, is your mom and dad there? Think about this, that there are two angels with you right now seeing what you're doing. Would you still do what you're doing? If you know there's angels Allah has, has, has put over you that will always protect you, are you still going to do what you do? Probably not. Right? Even guys, I tell the brothers this, like, like, when you're at home, don't walk around without your shirt on or with like a white beater or something, you know, like tank top. Because there's angels there, right? Even if you're like, yeah, I'm just chill. Now dress modestly because the angels are with you. Right? Uthman was so modest that the angels were shy of Uthman. That's how modest he was. So your modesty with angels, number three, modesty with one another, with each other. Right? And the example of this, you're having gender relations talk tomorrow, right? The example of this is Musa alayhi salam. Right, he goes, he leaves, he kills, right, Musa, you know, the one punch, and one punch, one, he, he punched one, one man and killed him with one punch. So he had to leave the city, he goes, and he sees two women on the side in Median who are trying to wait for water. They're waiting to, to, to water their flock of, 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 of the, the, their cattle and whatnot. And so he asks them, he sees them, and he sees, okay, there's all these men here around the well, and there's these two sisters on the side. So he says, ma You know, what's up? Like, or what do you need? Right? He didn't say, hey, sisters, what's your name? You know, can I get your number, your email address, your G-chat? No, to the point. Right, when you interact with guys and girls, when you interact with each other, to the point. They said, we have to wait to get the water. So he goes and gets it for them. That's it. Then they leave, and one of them comes back, and Allah, Allah says that, she comes back, ala stihya. She came back walking with modesty. What does the scholar say? What does that mean? Two things. One, she covered herself properly. Even Abu Khattab said that she even covered her face out of her modesty. And two, when they were walking back, who walked in front of who? Musa they said, I walked in front of the sister. And how would she give him directions? By throwing a rock. Turn right, you know, turn right on Ford Road. Turn left, right? Just throw a rock and Musa knew which way to go. He wouldn't even walk behind her because he knew how to. I mean, just the concept of lowering your gaze and things like this. So, modesty with one another. And this issue of gender relations, by the way, is, um, is very, it's, it's, uh, it's strong, right? Especially now in your age, the desires that you have and the hormones running through your body are very strong. Right? Imagine this. Imagine this scene. Imagine you're with the Prophet Wasallam, and the year before he dies, on Hajj, on his donkey with the Prophet. The, the Prophet's literally right in front of you. You could, like, hold him. You could touch him. You could kiss him. He's that close to you on his in Hajj. And so Fadl bin Abbas had that situation. He was rolling with the Prophet in Hajj. And so here comes a young sister to ask the Prophet him a question. Right? And so Fadl bin Abbas he just goes like this. And he starts looking. And so the Prophet him, how did he correct him? He just turned, he grabbed his cheek and he turned it away. <laughs> now if you were on the camel or in, 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 in the car with your dad, and you check his sister out, you might just get, mm. <laughs> But the Prophet ﷺ was Mu'allim. He was a teacher. He lowered his gaze. What happened to Fatima Abbas? On Hajj with the Prophet, his gaze again goes. A second time. And the Prophet ﷺ again turns his gaze away. A third time. On Hajj with the Prophet. That's how strong it is. Yeah. And the Prophet again turns his gaze and he says, Ya ibn Akhi, O the son of my brother. Inna hada yawm. This we are in a day. Man ghadda basara wa hafidha farajah ghufira lah. Whoever lowers his gaze and guards his, his chastity, his sins will be forgiven. That's the process of the teaching of Allah. After that, he lowered his gaze. That's it. But that's how the Sahabi on Hajj with the Prophet, that's how strong it is. So don't ever think, guys, pay attention, sisters, pay attention. When you get in youth group work, when you get in MSA work, don't ever think that, okay, I mean, it's, it's Islamic work, you know what I'm saying? I could chat with her online. No. Ibn Ba'a says that that is khalwa. Talking with a girl online is considered khalwa. If it's legit, then give it to me in the next khutbah, give it out. Read it out to everybody. Tell me if it's okay. Oh, brother, I mean, wait a minute now. I said it to me, you know what I'm saying? Have proper modesty with each other. Right? Hayat with one another. And lastly, the fourth type of hayat is hayat with yourself. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not going to spend time on that. Lastly, 
Okay, briefly. Haya with oneself means what? That if you do something in private, right? That if you did in public, people would blame you for it. That you wouldn't do in public because people would blame you for it. What does that mean? That means you are more worried about what somebody else will say about you than what you would say about yourself. Right? So have haya with yourself. Hold yourself to high standards. Lastly, I'm going to end with this, inshallah. With this point and then a, a, a story and we're, we're done, inshallah. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ himself, the Prophet ﷺ himself, the one who never commits a sin, the one who Allah ﷻ said about him that he, he's going to forgive any mistakes he's done, past, present, and future, the one who Allah ﷻ has connected his name to his name, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He himself would preserve his modesty. One time in nighttime, he was walking with his wife Safiya, Safiya bint Huyay. He's walking with her in his night, right? So you, there's no like street lamps or anything like that. So there's two Sahabi walking by and they see the Prophet with the woman, but they don't know who the woman is. So when they see that, they get a little nervous and they start walking fast away. They start leave, leaving. So the Prophet's like, Ala They're like, come back, chill out. Innaha Safiya bint Huyay. This is my wife, Safiya. Why did the Prophet say that? They said, Ya Rasulullah, we would never think that يعني, you would be walking with a woman or something. No way. But the Prophet said, No. But shaitan runs through your body just like blood runs through your veins. So I wanted to correct any, 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 any thoughts that might come to your mind. The Prophet himself would preserve his modesty. Now, how, what about us now? Think about this. Do we feel shy like that when we're walking with a girl at high school? Walk, I'm, just, I'm just walking into her car, you know what I'm saying? Post 9-11, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there might be some brothers trying to... <laughs> Do you feel that shyness? Do you feel that modest? Right, with the Prophet himself. Now what's interesting is, and, and, and inshallah ta'ala, the, the, the Prophet said he said that, he said, and you know the theme is about all the Prophets, right? The Prophet said, from the words of previous Prophets that still is followed today, that you still find today is, so all the prophets said this, if you have no haya, if you have no shame, then do as you wish, do whatever you want. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, from the words that from the words of the previous prophets that you still find today are, if you have no shame, then do as you wish. What does this hadith mean? Two main interpretations. One is, if you have no shame, do as you wish, and you're going to be punished for it in the Day of Judgment. Do whatever you want. Live it up. Live, live, live life large. But you will be punished for it on the Day of Judgment. Number two, though, is that it's a statement of fact. If you have no shame, then you will do as you wish. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says that this means what? Somebody who every time he sins, his haya, his level of modesty decreases one by one. To the point that he has no haya at all anymore. When that happens, he will sin publicly and he would have no qualms about it. Right? And what's, what's, what's scary about that is the Prophet sallam, he said, كُلُّ أُمَّتِي مُعَافَى إِلَّا الْمُجَاهِرُونَ كُلُّ أُمَّتِي مُعَافَى إِلَّا الْمُجَاهِرُونَ Every one of my ummah can and will, can be forgiven except for those who publicly sin. Now we're getting to Tawbah. Why is that important? Because if you think it's cool to be seen walking on campus with a girl, to be dating a girl, and to have no shyness in doing that, publicly doing something like that, posting your pictures on Facebook at the party, posting your pictures on Facebook with your hand around a guy or a hand around a girl. If you think that's cool, then be careful. Haya is the defining characteristic in Islam, and publicly sinning is one of the most detested things in Islam. Why? When you publicize your sins, you will make it a cool for everybody else to do. Right, oh, Muhammad was doing that, man. I could do it too. I mean, he's, he's a good Muslim, right? That's important. That's very, very important. If there's one thing you take away from the speech is this. Publicizing one's sin will lead to the doors of forgiveness of Allah being closed to you, period, until you make repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you stop publicizing 
stop sinning publicly because if you have haya, right? When you're when you're sinning, when you're watching that show you shouldn't be watching, at least you're making sure that your parents aren't there. You feel some shyness, you feel some shame. But when that shame is gone, then be careful because your heart is in the ICU and is about to die. When it gets to that point, you gotta wake yourself up. And brothers and sisters who know other people doing that, help each other out. Don't leave your brother or sister, you know, to shape on, to, you know, take him out like a wolf takes out a sheep. No, help your brother. The sheep stay strong because they all stay with one another. Help one another. The prophets were shepherds, right? The sheep stick together. You have to stick together and don't let your brothers and sisters fall to the traps of the shaitan. The Prophet have said that every one of my ummah can be forgiven except for those who publicly sin. He said, included among those is someone who sins at nighttime. He commits sins at nighttime. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covered up his sins. But then the next morning, he says, Oh, so and so, I have done such and such. And he spent the night being covered by Allah, and the next day he uncovered what Allah covered for him. Right? Guys tell him, Oh, you know, you know what you do? I got the day yesterday, man. Don't ever, ever talk about your sins. Don't ever publicize your sins. And what's interesting is that you can be forgiven by Allah. Don't, talk, don't, don't take it as that the doors of forgiveness are completely closed to you. No. You can be forgiven by how? By stop publicizing your sins, number one. Any sin that you do, stop that. And then number two, go back to Allah. The Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, in a hadith Qudsi, he said, O son of Adam, Allah the Almighty has said, O son of Adam, so long as you call upon me and ask of me, I shall forgive you for what you have done. And I shall not mind. It's not a big deal. Allah says, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah wants to turn in repentance to you. Right? He says, O son of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky, and were you then, were you then to ask forgiveness of me, I would forgive you. Your sins reach the clouds of the sky? And he turned to Allah, Allah will forgive you. Yeah, he will. The Prophet continued to say in the hadith, O son of Adam, were you to come to me with sins nearly as great as the earth? And you were then to face me, ascribing no partners to me, I will come to you with forgiveness nearly as great as that. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say to my servants who, has trans who have transgressed against themselves, they've sinned, don't ever, ever, ever give up on the mercy of Allah. Don't ever, ever give up on the mercy of Allah. Just like it's haram to, you know, do, you know, go dating, whatever. It's haram to give up on the mercy of Allah. Don't ever do that. No matter how much things you think you've done bad, Allah can forgive you. Allah says in Surah Furqan, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِنَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَئِكَ فَأُولَئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ For those who turn to Allah in repentance, Allah, imagine if you're the worst person on the face of the planet, right? Full of bad deeds. Your bad deeds are like, 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 the, like the ocean. And you come to Allah sincerely asking for forgiveness, and you meet the three criteria of forgiveness, asking Allah for forgiveness, which is one, you feel sorry for what you did. Write this down if you, don't, if, you, if, you, if you don't know this. You feel sorry for what you did. Number two, you stop doing it. And number three, you don't go back to it again. And if you do, you try again to stop. Three key, key, keys to forgiveness. For the one who does that, even if his sins are like the mountains, and he comes back to Allah in forgiveness, Allah will turn all those sins into good deeds. And now you, now you're back at level time. <coughs> and that's why you don't give up on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I have a couple minutes left, and so I'm going to end with, with two things. Number one, Musa alayhi salam. There was a drought with his people. And so he, he, he made dua, salat al istisqa, the dua for the rain. And he asked Allah to send them rain, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't send the rain. He said that, oh Musa, there is somebody in your nation. For the past 40 years, he has been sinning and transgressing against me. And because of him, the rain will not come. Now think about that. We saw Gaza and what happened to Gaza, right? And our hearts cried. Did we ever think that maybe it's because of our sins that the Muslims are suffering? Because of one man's sin, Allah SWT prevented the rain from coming. And so Allah SWT told Musa, tell him to leave. Leave your, your nation, go in the desert by himself, and he's going to die if he's by himself. And then the rain will come. So Musa makes an announcement to all his people. There is somebody amongst us who has been sinning for 40 years against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let him come out now 
and leave so that we shall get the rain. Now the man hears this and he knows Musa is talking to him. Imagine, imagine if I called somebody out and I said, somebody here, and I'm talking to somebody who's done so many bad deeds, stand up right now and leave this, this gathering. Wouldn't you feel shy? Like, man, why has he got to call me out in front of everybody? The whole nation, the whole conference is going to see who I am? So the man, he felt shy. Right? And so he made a dua to Allah. He said, oh Allah, forgive me, Allah. I have sinned for 40 years. But oh Allah, forgive me, please. And then all of a sudden, the, the rain clouds came. Musa alayhi salam said, Ya yeah, Allah, how? How, are, how is the rain coming? No one left. I didn't see anybody leave, so why, are the rain, why is the rain coming? And Allah Subhanahu told him, he has asked forgiveness for me, and so I have forgiven him. Musa said, oh Allah, show me him, because I want to see who this man is who you forgave. Now this comes back to publicly sinning. Allah Subhanahu wa tells him, I have covered his sins for 40 years. You never knew who he was. I have covered his sin for 40 years. So now, after he comes back to me asking for, for forgiveness, would I uncover him? No. No. And so this man gives us an example, gives us hope. Even if we sin, Allah can forgive us. And there was, there was a, a young sister. Her name was Sara. 22-year-old Lebanese sister. Her, her father was Muslim, her mother was Christian. They were divorced. Broken family. She wasn't too religious. Her parents weren't too religious. So she moved to Australia. She moves to Australia and there she's living by herself. So she's working. And she's studying full-time student, college student. And she's working at the bar. Muslima. She's also very beautiful. She's won beauty pageants. She's been on the cover of magazines. She's done everything and anything you can think. Cover of magazines, I mean, working at the bar with a boyfriend. All the sins you can imagine. And then she goes over to her friend's house and she sees a speech about modesty. And that really struck a chord in her heart. And so she goes home and she writes a letter to the sheikh who gave the speech. And she says, I have left no sin untouched. I'm on the cover of magazines. I've won beauty pageants. I have a boyfriend. I work at the bar. And she told him everything. And she said, can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me? And so the sheikh right away responds, of course, Allah can forgive you. And he mentioned that hadith and I, as I told you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive anyone. No matter how big your sins are, he can forgive you if you go back to him in repentance. <coughs> and so then she responds with a letter. And she says that she's, she's memorized Surah Al-Naba. Hamaytasa'anu. In two days. And she, she asked the Shaykh to help her learn how to pray. And so the Shaykh teaches her how to pray over, over their correspondence and email. Then she writes a letter, another letter to the Shaykh one week later, ten days later. And she says, Shaykh, I have good news for you. I have memorized Surah Yusuf. Surah Yusuf is a ten or eleven page surah. In ten days she memorized it. And she says, Shaykh, I started wearing hijab and I left my boyfriend and I no longer work at the bar. Within 10 days. Within 10 days. And then she, then she writes a letter to the shaykh and her tone changes. She says, Asalaamu Alaikum. She says, I have, I want, I want to do more for Islam. But it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has another plan for me. And that's all she said. And the shaykh is confused. What does that mean? What does that mean? And then she gets, he gets her last letter that she sends. She, say, she says, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. I'm on the way to the hospital. I have lived 22 years of my life away from Allah in only three weeks with Him. So make dua for me, please. And that's the last letter he gets from the Shaykh, from, from, the, from the ground, from Sarah. And that's it. Shaykh, what does that mean? What's going on? Sometime later, a friend of hers writes to the same Shaykh and says, Shaykh, Sara, she had been diagnosed with cancer, metastatic cancer. It was so late in the, in the stages, the doctors couldn't do anything and she died. And she died and that's it. 
And the whole time when she was writing to the shaykh, she's saying, Shaykh, you know, make dua for me. Can Allah forgive me? Does Allah love me? Asking these questions. She's somebody who did probably more sins than we did, right? I mean, I don't think any of us have been on the cover of a magazine, or worked at a bar, committed adultery, drank alcohol, all those things. And she went back to Allah. And she died on that stage. I'm jealous of her. I'll be honest with you, I'm jealous of her. Because the Prophet said that you can live your life, your whole life, working like the deeds of somebody who's going to be from hellfire. And just, until you're this close, just a hand's length away from hellfire. And then what is written overtakes, overtakes you and you start doing good deeds. You die like that and you enter into paradise. So brothers and sisters, my time is up. And so I end with reminding you the summary of the speech. Number one, struggling to do good deeds is normal. Struggling to overcome sin is normal. What Allah SWT wants from you is to keep trying. What Allah SWT wants from you is to every day to work harder and harder and never to give up. And if you fall, you stand up again. If you fall again, you commit sin again, you come back to Allah again. You keep crying and you keep crying. And you keep making tawbah to Allah. Number two is don't ever, ever publicize your sins. Be it on Facebook or on MySpace. Be it talking to your friends about which girl you were with or which exam you cheated on. Never ever do that. Because it makes it popular amongst everybody and then it makes it commonplace. Don't ever publicize your sins. And number three, no matter how many sins you have, be it like the oceans, be it like the mountains, be it as big as this earth, if you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sincere heart, you come walking to Allah, you come repenting to Allah, you come crying to Allah, Allah comes running back to you. Allah says in the Quran, He wants to forgive you. Allah says that those who have transgressed, don't, don't, don't ever, ever give up on my mercy, for I can forgive you. So make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make tawbah sincerely and look at your life and say, can I be like Zuhair who, had, who didn't have any strength? Can I be like him and do something for Islam? Can I be like Sarah and come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can I pave my own path to Jannah? Yeah, you can. Allah has says in the Quran, who wants tobacco? He chose you. He chose you above everybody else for a reason because he sees something special in you that he didn't see in other people. And because of that, just by that simple fact alone, can be enough for you to have hope that Allah can admit you into paradise if you just come with a sincere heart to him.